Greetings, everybody. This is Christopher Messina coming at you from the Bessie Time Studios here on the Space Coast of Florida, the last free state in America. It is the 21st of July, 2023. Pardon the hiatus. Your glittering host has been paddling around the Adirondacks, clearing his head. Uh, and I'm delighted to have as our guest on our first show back from our, our uh, northern New York uh, uh, break, Jack Pitts, who's the CEO of Slictionary. Uh, Jack will jump into his background in a moment. I would just say that we uh, had a delightful time sharing the stage uh, at a panel at London Blockchain uh, Conference a little while back, where we were by far and away the most glittering speakers on the on the docket. Uh, and Jack, so you know, thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. Yeah, I think you you left out about the part that uh, I think we got along much better backstage than we did on stage. So uh, it, was, it was really great meeting you. We had somehow had a lot in common, uh, including the fact we were both at the Brownstone Institute. Um, we have lived parallel lives without bumping into each other for quite a while. Brown didn't even know who you were. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Although I think I'd probably seen one of your podcasts or or two of them before that, uh, just randomly. You know, sometimes yeah. you you watch podcasts and you don't really know who the host is, but you're like, oh, this looks like a good one. And I, I know I caught the one uh, where you had Craig Wright on, and uh, yeah. maybe there's a couple of those. I don't know. He's come on a few times. He's he's always he's always good quality. <laughs> he's a lot of fun. <laughs> That's very true. Yeah. So, uh, so what are you yeah, working on? Tell tell us all about it. We, you dive into your background a bit, but we both have spent a huge amount of time on Wall Street, and that's less fascinating to most people. But kind of the, the selection right thing and and the uses you're seeing for blockchain. You take it away. What do you what do you think is kind of most compelling, and why you're doing what you're doing? Well, in a nutshell, in one sentence, I'm just Mel Gibson looking for my Sean Penn. So uh, <laughs> if, you, if you've ever seen the movie, uh, The Professor and the Madman, um, I'm probably both the professor and the madman to a certain extent, because uh, no, no sane person would try to usurp the Oxford English Dictionary, the Cambridge Dictionary, uh, Wikipedia, um, Urban Dictionary um, and Miriam Webster's, and and those are, I think Miriam is over two hundred years old at this yeah. point. And, and quick uh, aside for my for my Jewish listeners who don't want to support Mel Gibson at the box office, right. you can read the book The Professor and the Madman without ever having to go see Mel do his crap. <laughs> well, that well that's why it's brilliant that Sean Penn is in there because that's like uh, the Robin Givens to Howard Stern, right? Like he, he he's <laughs> he's maybe the reason why your your Jewish listeners would be like, okay, so it's not too bad. It's got Sean <laughs> Penn. <laughs> <laughs> Balance the act. Uh, we, we we don't we don't have purity tests here. We're free speech absolutists, <laughs> right? Yeah. Listen to whatever maniac you want to. But anyway, the book was phenomenal. I love the book, so I assume the, the movie was fun too. But for Slictionary, how how are you taking on the uh, the OED and Merriam-Webster and every other dictionary in the world? What's what's the approach? The approach is like anything else in like academics, or you know, how did Einstein come up with general relativity? You know, he 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 thought intuitively and, and creatively, but he also borrowed all the math from Lorentz. Like, you know, they always say uh, genius uh, rides on the shoulders of giants and it's it's no different for us. Uh, we have a lot of respect for OED and their quotation system, which I thought was the, the brilliant part of what they did. Uh, we have even respect for Urban Dictionary, which is, uh, you know, a lot of chicanery and shenanigans there, but, um, which are both defined in the Urban Dictionary, I imagine. And 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 just quick, I didn't want to interrupt, but in terms yeah. of you made, made you re reference to the quotation system at the OED, assume my listeners know nothing about how dictionaries are constructed and work. Right. right. Like what, what is it about? What is it? Why did you like it? Well, it was always very hard to write a dictionary because the language actually moves fast. And, uh, you know, it seems like it moves slow, but... When you look back, you think, well, we speak English as members of this empire, you know, called the English Empire, if you like, which uh, stretches something like a quarter of the globe at certain uh, in certain centuries. But we don't we're kind of running out of Latin speakers. Uh, the church kind of maintained it for a while, the Catholic Church, but that's uh, been since switched. And so the irony is the last major empire, uh, almost all of that language is gone. And yet 
uh, the best way to learn your vocabulary in English is to take Latin. Essay, right? Um, so well, the derivation. Say, say, Aman, Sini, Ravali. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Unfortunately, uh, my my I I did not take Latin in high school as an elective. I took uh, computer science, so <laughs> um, which is a, a bit of irony for a dictionary guy. Yes. Um, <laughs> But the uh, the language changes so fast that they the guy in the movie that, that's played by Mel Gibson or the guy in the book, um, I should know his name, Murray, Dr. Murray. He kind of came up with the math where he said, what what if what if we got every English professor in the UK to start writing definitions and quotations uh, and how would we be able to catch up and write a dictionary? And the answer was no. <laughs> and part of the reason is because the English language was uh, taking on new terms thanks to the Industrial Revolution and, and other uh, advances and printing and all this other stuff. They couldn't catch up. So uh, he, hmm. he said, well, the, the only solution is to crowdsource it. Right. The, the great irony is that the I call the OED the the Lord protector of the English lexicon. Um, and the irony is that they were crowdsourced. Yep. And so there is no argument that crowdsourcing is the best dictionary, uh, first of all. And we actually, I can actually document that. So a, a word like Bitcoin, um, somewhere on my computer here, I have a list of dates for every major like top 20 dictionary and when they define Bitcoin. And it turns out the earliest one was like 2011. And I think it was, I think it was Urban Dictionary was right. the first one that's great uh, which is further proof that if if you uh similar to what google does in search if you tap the wisdom of the crowd it's it's tough to beat um and and that makes sense right in an ai sense we're all busy trying to you know use these neural networks to to write in uh, you know sensible paragraphs and and, and make pictures and everything but what people don't realize is that the system that that neural network uses is the same system and even the same word as what the dictionaries use. And that's called the corpus. And, uh, you know, you're smart enough to know what a corpus is. But for your audience, the corpus We're also is very smart. <laughs> <laughs> the corpus is the references that you use to make the thing you're making. So. In what the Oxford English Dictionary did was they said, well, you know, back in 18, whatever it was, they didn't have, a, you know, there wasn't as many books as there are now. So they just said, well, here's the books that we trust that aren't written by charlatans, such as the Bible and uh, Beowulf and everything else they could find uh, that had everything from Old English to Middle English to Modern English. And they said that these are kind of where we're going to get our quotations. So what is a quotation? A quotation is kind of like finding the earliest reference or the best reference uh, use of the word in like a sentence. Um, I, you know, we're, we're people, we, we don't just like invent a word and then start right. using it, right? We, we kind of so tend- A good example to... would be, the French are scurrilous dogs from 1067 after the Battle of Hastings. <laughs> oh, I tell you what, let me go outside here for a second. Someone must have set off the, uh, Ah. Here, and it's really obnoxious. That is really terrible. Wow, that is obnoxious. Okay. Ah. We'll get a better background. Here, I'll give you the beach background there. Look at that. See? Yeah. <laughs> for, the, for those people who are wondering, you know, whether it's good to get into the dictionary game, I present to you Jack's yeah. surroundings. <laughs> well, we have a, a very old school neighbor, which is like a hotel here that hasn't been knocked down, but there, then there's all these like ginormous multi-million dollar pads around it. So it's an interesting spot <laughs> here in Seaside uh, Park. But the, yeah, the, so the corpus is exactly what AI uses, something like uh, ChatGPT, or actually that's exactly what ChatGPT does. And, and this brings up a lot of interesting topics because hmm. the first thing I think they're going to encounter is, I won't call it plagiarism, but it's kind of a, well, do you have rights to the corpus you used to make chat GPT happen because that's where all the magic comes in and frankly that's where all the gerrymandering begins as well so if you you know if you want to politicize your AI and how it writes and who it writes about and the opinions it sort of has 
it, that's going to depend on your corpus. And that's a very hot topic right now because obviously people are getting canceled on Twitter and YouTube. And so that corpus is uh, very one sided and that that's fine. Right. I mean, we have that we've had that in the newspaper business for probably 100 or more years or maybe even since inception. But we need both sides a lot of times. So the choice of corpus is incredibly important. And our choice of corpus is the human race. So we don't discriminate. You compete to be in our dictionary. And if you write a definition for podcaster, and I write a definition for podcaster, may the best man win. And it's kind of like a hot or not, like, or Tinder, where you, you don't like the definition you're reading for something like woman. Right. You go, well, that doesn't sound familiar or anything that makes sense to me. You can just swipe left or right yeah. and get someone else's definition. And what I like to kind of summarize it as is, let's say you're doing a wedding speech and you get up and you want to, you know, pontificate about love. Well, instead of saying, well, Miriam Webster says love is defined as, you know, you can Which say Which is something. really exciting stuff for a toast. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But you, but you could get up there and say, well, Meg Ryan, Oscar winning actress and star of the most rom-coms in history, defines love as, and, and that kind of adds a little bit of intrigue to the definition because then you're sure. thinking about the actual person and it could be anybody i just picked Meg Ryan. i don't i don't know much about her but the point is that corpus that allows competition creates um a lot of intrigue in the dictionary it would make you want to look in the dictionary so the word art right nobody really looks that up by kindergarten uh, everybody's parents and teachers have told you what that means but in our dictionary it would be really cool because we can put a, an original, uh, uncopyable digital art piece by Banksy and have it sit next to one by Jasper Johns and uh, Andy Warhol. I mean, some of these guys right. are dead, but you, you get the point. And you could left or right and go, oh, that's cool. Like Andy Warhol's definition of art is just like mind blowing or you know, Michael Jordan's definition of basketball versus Bill Russell or LeBron James. And, and that makes you want to go to the dictionary instead of like, oh, I feel stupid. I don't know what oxymoron means. Now you're like, hey, I wonder if there's like a cool celebrity or expert that they find oxymoron in some oxymoronic way, you know, and then you're like, wow, going to the dictionary is a lot of fun. Here's, here's a good and question for you. Okay. Yeah. So that, that's, uh, and here's a question I would ask then, because the major problem I have with Wikipedia is yeah. that. There's no there's no guidance and there's there's information that's just plain wrong. So if I go on and write oxymoron is a formerly smart person who got hooked on oxycodone is now a complete idiot, right? That's a compelling and fun definition. It's wrong, but how do you deal with um in, you know objectively incorrect inputs to the corpus because there's a gray area there. Because there might oxymoron in, in urban slang might very well be someone who's got hooked on oxy and is now an idiot. Right. Well, thanks to this podcast, it might actually become one of the uses of my oxymoron. third neologism in a week. All right, I'm on the roll. <laughs> I mean, seriously, all it would take is for me to start saying that in that fashion and you just and and if it catches on, it, it becomes the word. Um, so how do we do it? We use economics. So if you don't ever see that definition because it's, you know, number 17 in the competitive left right sliding economy yeah. and you don't uh, click the little we call it a like bulb, which is sort of like a thumbs up in uh, Twitter, um, then you, it doesn't make any money. And so yeah. we have this very clever system, kind of like real estate on Madison Avenue in Manhattan, where if your definition isn't making money, you raise it, you, you like you demolish it, you redeem it, you melt the coin because our definitions are on a Bitcoin, which has a value, a substrate value, a land value. And what do you do with a tenement on Fifth Avenue uh, in Manhattan? You destroy it and put up a hundred story building and you make a fortune, right? right. Uh, but the land is going to have a value because of where it is. And that's the same in Bitcoin, right? 
the economics behind how Bitcoin actually gets its fundamental value uh, majorly comes from uh, apps like Slictionary that are putting information on coins, just like you would put a butcher, a baker, a candlestick maker business or building on a piece of land in Manhattan. And if it stops earning money due to competitive reasons, uh, you raise it, you put up another building and you do something else. So how does Same the definition, how does because this is your model, how does the definition earn money? Yep. So this like bulb system where someone comes in, looks up the definition of woman and says, you know, this is one of the, you, you pay a penny. So there's no more ads. There's no more uh, bugging you for a subscription for $7.99 a month, uh, like Spotify or Wall Street Journal. There's just, hey, would you part with a penny to get knowledge, right, in, in a very small, chunky form? And, you know, some people go, well, why would you do that when it's free? I mean, op right now, if you're watching this podcast, open up another tab and uh, hit dictionary.com and, and see how enjoyable that experience is where if you don't, if you, it's hard to even find the seek bar to put the word in because there's so many ads on it. There's ads on top of ads. And then when, if you wait too long and you don't find the seek bar, they throw a ginormous pop-up ad. And, and it's like, if I look over your shoulder and I'm a, like a young college guy in uh, you know, the university library, and I see some attractive girl on her laptop and she's, and, and, and this is when Slictionary is a top 20 dictionary and she's messing with pop-ups to look up a word I just, I'm like, I'm not, I don't want to date that girl no matter how pretty she is because she doesn't value her time. Like, you wouldn't pay <laughs> any, right? Like, you know, people... I don't know if I, if I was that discerning at a younger, younger age. <laughs> I, I wasn't even. Yeah. a lot of inefficiencies, illogicalities, flat out stupidities. But then again, <laughs> I am aggressively shallow. And I would assume <laughs> others are more thoughtful. And how they choose to go about the dating ritual. But I, I, I take your point. <laughs> I'm going to change that example to if you're on your second divorce and you've gotten a little smarter about your you got a little smarter, right? And you don't want to now have three halves of your of your salary going out the door, <laughs> <laughs> which turns out to be very tricky, even though the courts can't do math and they don't care. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Plus, when you're older, you're running out of time. So you value it much more. And can you define phrases because along that vein, right, and kind of semi-urban dictionary or not, uh, old business partner of mine, funny, funny guy, commodity trader, um, he used to say, like, we'd be, you know, be out somewhere like PJ Clark's or something back when it still existed in the NYMEX building. Yeah. And there'd be some, you know, uh, early 30s associate who's who's been working hard and he's at the bar and like some pretty girl walks over to him. And, you know, and of course, he's an idiot because he's married and chatting away and, and, and dumbhead would come back and my partner would look at him and say, I got two words for you. Visitation rights. <laughs> <laughs> and th those two words yeah. threw more cold water. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's funny you mention that because just this morning uh, I read something by this guy named Rob Henderson, who I have no idea who he is, but it kind of touched the chord because he basically said, I am the inventor of the phrase luxury beliefs. Have you have you heard of this? It's a good phrase. phrase. All you get 15% of America is consumed by luxury beliefs. All of wokeism <laughs> is a luxury belief. You know, the, well, I used to, I've had this statement constantly and I get into fights about it. When someone babbles to me about microaggressions, I will point to roughly 7.8 billion people on the planet who would trade their lives for a cushy middle-class office job in America where they get microaggressed at every afternoon. Oh, <laughs> really? Sign up for that today. <laughs> so, yeah, no, <laughs> microaggressions are a luxury belief or a luxury concern. A, they don't exist, and B... You can only care about crap like this if you are not worried about eating, not getting shot at, right, being right. inside, right? All the things that consume a lot of the world on a daily basis, but not right. fat, useless Americans. Or if you just live in the Philadelphia area where everybody has very thick skin because we're attacking each other verbally all the time for sport. There you go. See? <laughs> luxury. Anyway, I interrupted. Sorry, but luxury beliefs is, to me, a triggering phrase. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. Well, I didn't, I had never heard of it prior to this morning, but of course, when you hear it and, and someone even mildly explains it, you get it right away. And yep. apparently this guy must have wrote a book or an article where he described it. And, uh, and, and look at you. I, I didn't even know what it was, but you picked it up right away. And uh, so therefore it's a phrase. And yep. the, the funny thing is we're doing these things called celebrity word auctions where we take, you know, our ultimate goal is maybe uh, Michael Jordan defines basketball. And if we can get that done, then we'll have made it as a dictionary because mm. you'll definitely pay a penny to see that. You'll even you'll even figure out how to get a Bitcoin wallet to see that, right? Right. But we these celebrity word auctions are really important because what it is is we ask uh, an expert. Uh, it could be a local expert. Maybe they're only famous in the Scrabble world. You know, I don't know who the Scrabble champion is, but they all know. And they pick a word to donate to the dictionary as you know a, a pundit and they uh, auction it off to the highest bidder and it's you know everybody uses nfts it, ours is not really an nft ours is the thing it's not the token of the definition it is the definition and it's on it's on a coin and so we ship the coin to the highest bidder so a guy named daniel krawitz uh, popularized the term hyper bitcoinization and he's going to write that on about August 10th and the auction ends July 31st. It's at a hundred dollars right now. So here's an example of something that's never been done before, which is a huh. word where a definition now has a tradable price and it could you know, sit on a marketplace and fluctuate like a stock. And it also has a cash flow because Daniel's definition, every time it gets liked, will get seven tenths of a penny. Right. in perpetuity right and here's the cool thing daniel coined this term in a paper he wrote in 2014 and everybody in the bitcoin world says it right, right. and we have this video of all these like famous like you know famous if you're into bitcoin people saying it so it's a word just like uh, luxury luxury beliefs is now a phrase and so you're not only owning the definition you're owning the definition from the guy right right like Craig Wright, so defined it's a practical matter. So I say I, I decide gotta have it, and I come in and swoop in and buy the definition for five hundred bucks right before the auction closes. Does that mean <laughs> that the seven tenths of a penny now go to me every time when someone clicks on it? That's the amazing part. Yeah. So if I do my job as the head of this dictionary and I can get us into the top twenty uh, dictionaries, I can almost guarantee you that you will not only get all of your five hundred dollars back. But as long as that word stays relevant, um, because it's written by the guy, it's probably going to make you a lot more money than the 500 you spent on. And that's what's really cool. Oh, huh. that's interesting. And so for all kind of words that just exist, like and or dirt, right? <laughs> right now... That do you just kind of absorb all of that from online dictionaries so it's already there? Or how, no. how does that happen? So if I'm gonna who who gets the, the seven tenths of a penny when I want to find out what dirt is defined as? Anybody. Any again, our corpus is every living person that can write and read and and, and make you know, sense. I, I mean, in a very practical sense, right now today, I go look up you don't dirt. have it. What dirt? Dirt right now is like a lot in Manhattan in 1806, right? Yep. There's nobody on it. It's it's vacant and there's a ton of traffic. But are you gonna are you gonna be the one to define it and put that building up for dirt? You know, I don't know. You could do that right after the podcast. I'm going. I'm on it. Right? I'm gonna get the dirt's going up, baby. Whoever wants right. to hear about my definition of dirt, check out Slictionary. Right. Like think of it this way: if the guy, you know in 16 whatever uh landed on manhattan and bought it for the 24 pieces of wampum um was like well let me city plan this thing uh because i want this to be a ginormous city i'm going to precede it with a bunch of tenements like a bunch of rickety shacks and i'm going to have it all lined up on the avenues that we have today and it, they're all going to be cheap rickety shacks but you know at least people will come here and go oh this is a city well why would I want that? Like, I want, I want to just open up Manhattan and go, let me sell, let me sell lots by the piece. 
and yeah. we'll have a protocol, right? These are going to be the avenues and the streets. So we'll do that much for you. So there's not chaos, but, but essentially we're going to sell the lots and, and you build what you want to build here. Right. And that's what, that's what we want to go for. So in a way it's penalizing ourselves because the first thing that people do when they come to our dictionary is they generally look up a word like dirt and it's not in there. And they're like, this right. is the worst dictionary ever. The worst dictionary um, in the world. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> Now, the funny thing is, when you do that, we actually have a solution to that where we take your penny and we put the whole penny up on this thing called word bounty, which is a reward for anybody that defines the word. So let's say a thousand people look up dirt and get disappointed. They can donate their penny in exchange. Uh, well, the way it's originally supposed to work is supposed to email you the definition when it's finally defined. Uh, but we're, we have to fix that a little bit. So we're still working on it. But the idea is you still get your definition, maybe not as fast as you wanted it, but your penny builds up every single time. So if a thousand people look up dirt and don't get it, there's going to be a $10 reward for someone to define it. And we pay them in about a 10 day contest. We call this a word bounty contest. So for instance, right now, and, and you can actually put up a word bounty contest as an investor. So think of it like this. You don't know what's going to be on your Manhattan plot, but you know that this real estate's valuable and you know that you need a butcher shop. So you could put up like a hundred thousand dollar, you know, bounty on butchers to move from other areas in the colonies and uh, put their butcher shop right in the center of uh, where all the Wall Streeters are in downtown. And the, the, the guy who builds the best uh, butcher shop uh, gets the hundred thousand right off the bat. Right. And then you own the butcher shop after that, right? So that's kind of what we're doing. We're saying you can come in and invest in dirt. You can put $2 down or $2,000, start a contest for who defines the word dirt the best. And all those definitions that get submitted plus the winner all go to you. Now you're the owner of all those dirt definitions. And then if so, how, know, so how, how many people have been doing this so far? What's the what's the activity rate on the platform in relation to this? this oh, right now, it's still tiny. Uh, we're in our second year uh, and our product really didn't meet MVP until about the end, like December. OK, so we, we haven't even really started marketing yet outside of like this tiny little Bitcoin community. And what, and what was the genesis? I mean, really, what and uh, you know, in terms of of all the stuff that I know you've been involved <laughs> with and know how to do, like, what was it was like? God damn it, it's going to be word auction. It's going to be brilliant. I'm on it. Like, what 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 was what was the or was there some bright light epiphany or was it something that fell out of a more of evolutionary process? You were looking for a business model. No, this goes back forty years. So. In the class, I, I got my first elective. Uh, actually, I just met the teacher at a reunion who brought el electives to our high school. There was no such thing as electives in high school in 1986. Right. And uh, this this teacher, Mr. Peter O'Toole, he he was like, I think we should let the students pick a few subjects. Wouldn't that be radical wild? maniac? Radical maniac. Yeah. He get, uh, he'd be investigated principal. by the FBI right now for being a domestic terrorist for suggesting that teachers or, or students or parents have something to say about their own education. <laughs> right, yeah. Crazy left-wing lunatic. Anyway. Insane, <laughs> insane, yeah. Electives. We know what they need to know. We're going to tell them. <laughs> but watch your opinion, exactly. I'll give it to you. <laughs> exactly, yeah. And uh, he's a big believer in that and still is. He actually became principal uh, of the school for like a decade and just retired. Right. So actually part of the uh, reason for going back was to honor him. But um, I have him to thank because... The, my sophomore year, I was allowed to pick a bunch of subjects, and one of them was computer science, and the other was Latin, as I just mentioned before. Right. I sat, I picked Latin because my mother told me, well, that's how you're going to get a high SAT, is you better take some Latin. So I'm like, all right, that sounds like fun, mom. You know, like you getting high other SAT. Rolling ideas for me. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. But I really liked computers. So I sat in the Latin class for two days and it was like my eyes were bleeding and I was just, I was in physical pain listening to this teacher talk <laughs> about this ancient language that I was never going to be able to speak. And so I, I went home and I'm like, are you sure I'm, I, I shouldn't just take computer science? She's like, there's no jobs in that. Nobody's ever going to make any there's money. There's no jobs in that. That's ridiculous. <laughs> right. Computers. 
this internet thing will never take off. It's not the <laughs> way to see if it'll work. Exactly. So, uh, so I, I F minus for mom on the prediction of technological developments <laughs> yeah. in America. It's okay. I'm sure she's a lovely woman. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, well, I overrode her because I basically said, well, this is an elective. I believe it's my choice as to what I picked. So I was like, I'm not doing this Latin stuff anymore. It stinks. So I went and in and you learned the, you learned the meaning of elective by the little bit of Latin you did do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the electoral, yeah, exactly. electoral, electoral, right? <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, precisely. So uh, so I went into computer science. I had this wonderful teacher, Mr. Russell, and he was the physics teacher and the computer science teacher, which was brand new in 85. They didn't even have computer science. Uh, they had computer literacy, which was like this tiny little semester long course. And he introduced the whole program from scratch. Uh, giant like like micro computer in the back room that had at least you know five kilobytes of memory. <laughs> right. A monster. And, uh, yeah, I took that for three years. It, it there was actually uh, computer science uh, A B and B C and all that like uh, stuff we have for calculus and everything. And uh, I, as a senior, my our senior project was well, go build something useful. Okay, so I had three. Uh, three uh, guys in my group, two of which uh, run like one of the biggest um, technology companies in the Philadelphia area, uh, mm. who are also at this thing. And uh, we built uh, my idea, which was a self-learning uh, self uh, spell checker. That's awesome. And the way it worked was it would read the paragraph and take the first word like the, and say, it would come back to you and ask you the question like, is this really spelled correctly? Like, you know, go verify it. And if you press yes, then the will never be questioned again, right? And the quick, okay, quick, is that a word? Is that, okay, brown fox jumped over. By the time you get through the whole paragraph, you've got, now got a corpus of correctly spelled words. Yep. And the dictionary just continues learning that way right. until, sure, it's annoying, but even for, if it was just back then, you didn't have an internet really, so it was just on your personal computer. So it would be like the world's most annoying spell checker but it would also nail everything like your mom's name and like your last name and all the stuff that's like personal to you. It would, it would skip that. Unlike today where it still happens that it picks out your names. Like this isn't a word, puts the little red line under it. And so we built this and it broke the mainframe because the mainframe didn't have enough memory, even for the paragraph. So by the time the, the program got to the middle, and was storing all the spellings. It was like, we're out of memory. You've destroyed our entire computer system here at your high school. Thank you. Well so done. Brian, <laughs> yeah, yeah, good job. So we got push, an A plus. Pushing the data envelope even at a young age. <laughs> <laughs> so we got an A plus and you know, it's like one of those moments in your personal history where something went right and you got a little bit of like, hey, that was pretty cool. You know, nobody thought of that. And uh. And then I just looked out into the real world and sure enough, there was no real like learning uh, spell checker that didn't happen for like another decade. So it was like a rare instance where uh, I had thought of this system uh, that actually could have worked had I ignored my mom and went into computer science as a living. Um, <laughs> and the funny thing is that even goes back further to when I was like eight and in my mom's uh, math lab where she uh, tutored math at a local community college. She had an Apple II computer that had the first virus on it, which was a game called Animal, written by John Walker, who is the founder of AutoCAD and now is like retired in Switzerland. And he uh, not only he he's really responsible for the first virus. So it was this on floppy drives, the yeah. Animal program would repeat itself. And basically it was 21 questions, but restricted to animals and the computer would guess your animal and try and figure out the answer. And, and as a kid, everybody was playing uh, Wozniak's breakout on the Apple II because it was colorful, fun. I mean, it was like a normal video game. I was playing animal because I couldn't believe that a stinking computer could guess my animal in less than 21 questions. And the coolest thing about this program is at the very end, if it didn't get your animal, and you, you had like leopard and it, it didn't guess it right, it would then ask you to write a question that's a yes or no answer such that it could uh, nail down the fact that you picked leopard next time. Right. It would add the question 
So it was, it was learning, right? This is, this is like early AI in, in the way that I think AI should be done. Uh, you know, not neural networks, like learning from people's input. And uh, this again is a self-learning program in just one small area, but that concept led to me thinking of the self-learning uh, spell checker. And then that led to self-learning dictionary. So that's why our name is Slictionary. It's literally self-learning self -learning dictionary. dictionary. You know what I love about that is you just brought up for me when I was nine, I had an Apple II Plus. And yeah. the game that I played obsessively was this game about being a um, trader in the South China Seas. So you would choose which port to go to next, you know, Batavia, wherever it was. You right. would choose what cargo you were going to carry. And it was like metal, corn, rice, or opium. And if you, <laughs> if you chose the opium, of course, the profits could be huge. But if you got intercepted by the authorities, they would take your, your shipment, fine you, and take your boats. But you'd also run into pirates who might or might not be government officials. And so you had to make these decisions. And what I, I played this game obsessively, right? Yeah. And what I find funny looking back is you just say, hey, you were eight on your Apple II Plus thinking about that. All I, I constantly in the entire game, I would load up on massive amounts of contraband, and then whenever I came to um government ships that would intercept me between ports, it wasn't always right, it happened occasionally. And you had the, you also had the option to either let them board you and pay a fine or a bribe or fight. I'd be after about a week of playing that game, all I did was load up on opium and fight. <laughs> <laughs> and it was such a pure commodity trader approach to the world i was right i was basically refco <laughs> well the funny thing is did this cause you to get into what you're doing now with the like you, you you just look back at the things that you're drawn to and you're and I, my own yeah. children, i'm like you you are always going to succeed at something that you find utterly compelling like the folks who say i never worked a day in my life like Sam Zell, right? Real estate. Like if you're doing something you find intrinsically interesting, oh, yeah. the day will fly by and God willing what you're doing tends to make money. But yeah, in terms of that instant judgment of you're making risk weighted decisions with imperfect information and no knowledge of what's coming later, uh, then absolutely. Hold on. This is all that. Uh, then yeah, no, absolutely. It's, I, I find that absolutely hilarious. <laughs> At the time, everyone's playing all these different video games, the rest of it, and I was consumed by this trading game. Right. Yeah. And so I rather Bosniak... determined that on a risk weighted basis, you'd better carry opium and fight the authorities. That was the best way to make the most money. <laughs> I think you're gonna have to call this podcast title like the Wozniak Apple II and how it influenced everybody in the world podcast. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Right. Oh God, that is priceless. And I also that was the uh first time was I introduced to hacking because one of my cousins who was four years older, uh, he was uh very much into computers and for 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 a Christmas gift one year, I got a stack of three and a half inch floppies that had like 50 pirated games on them oh yeah that's it so i learned the difference between deal. binary run and run and and <laughs> how to oh yeah that was that's phenomenal isn't it funny when someone gives you something cool like the, the 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 speed bumps and the mountains you'll jump over to get it like yeah. like i always wanted to gamble on on sports games like like you know i just i was i always had an opinion when i'm watching a game and it's like why am i allowed to bet on my opinion without like contacting Moose and Rocco who are going to break my <laughs> yes, Who are going to help me find my checkbook later. <laughs> right. Like I don't even want to know these people, much less be beholden to them. So like I got online and I think like 97, uh, ironically, because I think I heard that you could, uh, you could throw a bet up on online and not, uh, you know, it would uh, automatically settle and then uh, nobody's going to break my knuckles. So, uh, yeah. you know, and, and what did you have to do? You remember this, like you had to, you had to, you had to wait, you had to like call a 1-800 number, talk to a human being, tell them your address. Then they'd send you a disc in the mail, wait two weeks, get the disc out of the mail, put it into your drive. Hopefully you have the right drive because right. if it's a DVD and you don't have the DVD drive, well, you're screwed. 
Then you put it in, it runs and whirs up, takes like three minutes to get going. Then you get these prompts, and then they ask you to dial another one in order to get something called like a DNS number, which as you know, have no idea what that even means. Yeah. And then you got to plug that in, and then eventually, after like a, a couple hours, you can finally dial into this service that takes like five minutes to even register on the internet. Yeah. And, and and people are like, well, you know, getting a Bitcoin wallet is so hard. <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. you have it's, no it's idea all what of hard. Eight is. seconds. It's horrifying. <laughs> right. words oh my god what am i doing 12 words right i have to download an app like that's i don't want to download it if i have to click a button and then walk away and it's already done that's just agonizing <laughs> right so that's part funny. of our mission is stuff like well if you look up hyper bitcoinization which was only coined in 2014 figuratively coined right um there's 36 dictionaries that we identify as our competitors and I think two of them have that word. And b- ironically, both of those are, well, I that's think that's a good question. So you're an online presence, right? So is it automatically indexed to all the search engines? So if I'm plugging the DuckDuckGo and I, I'm looking for a definition of you know, quirky, right? Um, is it, it it's sweeping through everything that's already available? Are you part of that data set that's already available? No, and we have no interest in being part of that data set. We're going to end around both Google and Mac OS, like right clicking for definitions uh, in a kind of special way that I don't want to mention yet until we release it. But we call it a uh, word caddy or glossarium. You tell me which one's the better name, but glossary actually comes from people writing things in the margins of books to tell yeah. you like, what a word means and everything. And uh, so we don't know what the title is going to be, but we've already designed it and it makes it actually one step easier to get your definitions than Googling them or uh, or even right clicking. And and plus, we just have better definitions. So, right. Uh, you're going to want to pay the penny. So no, nice. Uh, yeah. So, so we have a way around. How do that. people get to it? How do they how do they find it? They just slickdictionary.com or how do they how do they how do they get involved? Yeah, so right now it's just slictionary.com and uh you, you know you will you don't need uh Bitcoin to win the word bounties. You can go press the word bounty button on the main page and with just an email address. And the only reason we take that is uh, how else would we know who, you know, if you win, how are we going to know who to alert right. to send money to? But uh you so if can, you have something like a hand cash account or a wallet like that, you could just connect that and that will be how you would interact with a payment stream with the with the app. Yeah. So if you have hand cash already, you would just type your word in, hit the button, and it will say it'll log you in for like a year or something, right? So the first time it'll be like, oh, it'll flash to hand cash, verify you, and then come back, and then you look up your word. Um now after that when you say Bitcoin, this is important for some people. You're talking about BSV, not BTC. Yeah, the real Bitcoin. Yeah, the real Bitcoin, and that's gonna yeah. that's gonna be a a big nothing burger to 99 percent of my listeners. Uh, yeah. And for those who are paying attention, BSV is Bitcoin Satoshi Vision, which is the original defined Bitcoin off the paper, not the thing you see flashed across the evening news as BTC. Correct. Correct. Now, if you just, if you're like, ah, I'm not, in, you know, this is Bitcoin stuff's too hard, uh, but I would, but I'm watching this and I'm like, I have this great definition or word that I would love to throw in, like something like uh, uh, the, the phrase we just mentioned, phrases we just mentioned earlier. Or, or and, Taylor, the word that I put up. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah that's right. Um, you can send us, send us an email or follow uh, Slickson- at Slictionary on Twitter write us a DM or something and uh, I'll send you a, uh, a link so that you can just define it with no Bitcoin or anything. And uh, it'll go up. And if it, it when it makes its first penny, uh, then I will send you the instructions for how to get paid. Nice. Uh, and, and same thing on word bounty. So our record word bounty is $500 for world domination by a certain uh, Norwegian uh, billionaire slash businessman. Uh, we've had hundred dollar bounties. We have lots of twenty dollar bounties, and if you go to that page, it's just a list of words and 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 money attached to, to define it in a ten day contest. And if you click on one of the words that you like and enter the contest, you don't need Bitcoin. You just need an email address. And if you win the bounty, again, we'll email you uh, and say, "Hey, you won. Um, do you want to pick up your money? Otherwise, we'll keep it. That'd be fine for us too. <laughs> Good for us too." You get glor- glorification rights. 
I'll, that that's just, how we get the dictionary written from scratch. That's killer. I love it. I, I will broadcast it far and wide. Um, I love I, it, it's such a great innovation. I love to see um, both both a new approach to what people consider to be a kind of old, settled, boring thing. Uh, but I also love the the depth to which your passion for this and experience for this goes back to when you were eight screwing around with an Apple II. That's fabulous, right? That That's where some of the, you know, I was love with some of the things that, that you know, that, that was an overnight success. Yeah, every overnight success I've seen has been 40 years of work behind it, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and the funny thing is that the, the most interesting thing for me, uh, you know, the dictionary stuff is awesome and everything, but I just love watching all this AI stuff happen. Because when I played that animal game, uh, that's that's what I was thinking. I was like, this is incredible. Like the computer's learning. Um, now it's not like really learning like a human, I guess, would, but but I guess it is, right? Because it's learning, learning, it's learning within the constraints of what it, what was available to in terms of memory. It absolutely was learning. I now know not to do this. Much like you you stick your hand on a hot oven once, so you don't do that again unless you're right. really stupid. <laughs> or some or some random guy at a conference in a back room tells you that you can get uh, certain types of uh, precious metals out of Greenland soil. And I was like, is there even <laughs> any soil in Greenland? I didn't even think you get through the ice. You know, rocks full of 80% of the world's lutetium? No way. Who knew? Right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, uh, you know, again, that's uh, just like the, the game Animal. Like, you know, well, well, tell me how to think about that in the future, and I'll put that in my memory bank. and. We'll see if it works next time someone's asking me about this stuff so it's well, i'm going to encourage everyone to go jump on slictionary get yourself an account if you think you know anything about words and uh, uh smart linguistical like stuff uh you know enter the word bounties see if you actually have a talent for providing clarity about uh our language to your fellow english speakers or to buddy what i particularly love is um uh i i i, I all a lot of these things all assume societal goodwill right because and that's what i love about about bitcoin protocols with kind of zero with uh zero proof uh zero trust proof is that if you've got a goof bag who like says i know i'm gonna jump in and be the first to define every word i can totally wrong mattress is defined as a soft anemone that eats rust off your car when it falls into the bay of, like of, of fundy right um and if like eight people all got drunk and logged in and decided that in fact was the definition of mattress, you'd have this incredibly distorted uh, view of the world. But that you know, probabilistically, that's probably not going to happen, right? Right. But I saw it on Wikipedia. My last kind of thought about why that system of just whoever bothers to edit last has the last word. Oh, it's is, so messed up. It's just stupid. I remember I went just to test to see how how well the system worked. I went on and I looked at the, there's a entry for National Merit Scholarship. I don't know why I, I, I tested that. And there were some random people named who had, who had won one. I won a National Merit Scholarship. So I, I entered, you know, Christopher Messina, um, you know, the date, uh, National Merit Scholarship. And I left it there. And if you're on Wikipedia, you get a notification for when someone changes your work, right? Right. So I logged in and someone, well-meaning, not well-meaning, I don't know logged in and changed it to the actor, Chris Messina, who also grew up on Long Island in about the same time frame and said he had a National Medal Scholarship. Great guy, fun actor, not him, it's me, right? right. So <laughs> I went back and changed it. For whoever this guy was, a mega fan, a nerd, who knows? He spent, like, every time I changed it back, he went and miscorrected it. Insane, totally. And there's insane. no mechanism by which there's some rational adjudication as to controlling that. So I refuse to let anyone, if, if I have an analyst who cites Wikipedia to me, I'm like, once more, you're fired. That's not you're information. Fired. Imagine not this. Information. <laughs> Chris, imagine this. You know the cartoons we used to watch in the 80s, 90s, and it was like Bugs Bunny would draw the little mustache on the Mo Mona Lisa? Yeah. Imagine that's now just part of the art world. Like, well, Joey over here thinks the Mona Lisa would be much cooler if it had a mustache because that would show... Uh, that you know, Van, uh, not Van Gogh, Da Vinci was very uh, forward in his knowledge of uh, women and men, or whatever. Right. And you're like, oh yeah, well that that's a thing now. So now it has a mustache, and then right. someone's like, no, the no, ge the gender fluid Mona Lisa. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but like, but yeah, yeah. But da Vinci didn't know what he was talking about, so let's just change it. Like, ask your art friends if they would mind if you just help them 
like, well, this painting, I don't like the bottom corner. I'm just going to get out my little paint set and like put what should have been there. Right. Like if it was a, good a little Tonka truck in the corner of every <laughs> right. painting by Warhol or, or uh, uh, Mondrian would like, we, it would just bring it. I think it would bring it to life and make it more accessible. To <laughs> right. <the generation>. Right. <laughs> we don't want oh, to be exclusionary now. <laughs> yeah. But this Funny. is Wikipedia. It's like, yeah. oh, well, Nonsense. you're all the, the definition of recession uh, written by this other guy. I don't like it anymore. So this is now. That was my important. favorite moment. I've had so many favorite moments throughout of being being part of, sadly, in the Washington orbit. But when they decided to just change the definition of recession overnight and like every single journalist stared into the teleprompter and, and like told us that, in fact, the received boring, dry, technical definition of recession, that was actually not only or not not that we're changing it. But in fact, it never existed. You're wrong. It never existed. It's erased. That was, I mean, Orwell, if Orwell had submitted that story to his editor, the editor would have redlined it as being implausibly absurd and that no one's going to believe it. But when they, in a concerted effort from the White House press secretary to every journalist except for Fox News, looking at, you, looking at anyone questioning this change of definition... As if you're utterly insane. It never meant that. That was one of my favorite moments in American political history. And there have been many others. It was <laughs> mine too. You know, <laughs> it's funny you mention that because I have a whole spreadsheet. It's part of my research to write the, the real good article on this topic. And my spreadsheet is basically, I've gone back to 2001. And I don't know why I remembered that because I, I last worked on this like a couple months ago. But uh, 2001 was when Wikipedia first got recession put in. It was like one sentence and it was, it had bad grammar. It was awful. Right. And I literally started watching every single change to that sentence. And when a paragraph was added all the way through this, whatever it was, 2020, 2021 period where a bunch of people like, and, and I even charted like the activity. So obviously like they it's like, swarmed on to, to rectify this great error. <laughs> Right, right. So it's like you have this all this activity in the beginning, uh, and, and then it's like it, then it just kind of tapers off. It's like, oh, I guess it's a pretty good, uh, pretty good article here. You don't need to change it much. And then all of a sudden, no, 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 everything's wrong in here. Let's and change it. All. That's going to be the example of the other word that I'm putting in, which I use all the time, and I'll be using your words, which is you miscorrected me. Right. I get this constantly, right? Because I'll, I'll put something up and I tend to have opinions and I'll, well, before I got kicked off Twitter, but in other places. And my my favorite sort of engagement is some nitwit who who's going to quote unquote correct me right. and they're wrong. I mean, that is one of my misconceptions. No, it, is, it is intellectually so satisfying. It's like gummy bears wrapped in bacon. It's so good when some utter idiot in the public square is going to tell me why I'm wrong. And they're wrong. It is magic. It's just it is a magic, magic fluffy, cotton candy kind of feeling. <laughs> is this your term? Did you invent? It's correct. correct. Yeah, I've been using it for for a while. I don't. Maybe someone else used it, but I use it all the time. You miscorrected me. I love it. It, it, it is so it encapsulates so perfectly the gestalt of a lot of these moron keyboard warriors who know nothing and just. Blah, 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 blah. But it came up a lot when. Uh, uh, I wrote about this because, you know, the reason Donald Trump offered to buy Greenland was because my partner and I were in the White House explaining the value of our rare earth mine in Greenland to the White House. And shortly thereafter, President Trump decided to buy the country. Right. So this came up a lot because people would write comments online or people were on TV were saying, well, it's utterly absurd to think you can buy a territory. I'm like, I live in Florida. We bought this. The Louisiana Purchase. Did you study that? Alaska. We yeah. bought it. Like, we buy right. chunks yeah, of the world and they become part of our country. Beyond that, of course, their whole premise is Orange Man Bad was always wrong and insane. But he was the fifth president to have this, this very substantive conversation going back to 1850, right? So the number of people that, and this is, it always... Mis miscorrecting always happens with the added layer of condescension. That's the best part. <laughs> I have a I, I have an expression for this. I call it uh indignant ignorance. 
It's the indignant world. ignorance. It's the it's actual fabulous. opposite of peanut butter and jelly. It's the two things you can combine together that make the worst combination ever. Oh, it's magic. So I get, I got a chunk of massively, uh, massively condescending miscorrection on on that particular topic. It was magic. I, you know, if I were in your business, I would have kept the spreadsheet. If I could come up with a list, I'll send it. We don't need it. I'm going to show you what I'm going to do right now. Let me share. Let me share my screen. I want to show you something. We're okay. going to be miscorrected. All right. Let's see if we can do that. Hold on. I'm sure I can make that happen. That's really funny. Uh, okay. I will give you control. There you are. All right. This, you got to understand when I meet someone who's invented a phrase or maybe even thinks they invented a phrase, that's like catnip for a guy with a dictionary. <laughs> I'm sure. Right. Especially my dictionary, because it's written in stone, right? Once you put it in, it's in for as long, forever, as long as you want it to be in there. Okay. Right. So this is our main site, slictionary.com. We have a couple of control buttons, five right now, but one of them is gavel. And this is where experts, celebrities, influencers can put their word up for auction. And uh, we all bid on it. So right now uh, we're running this auction for, as I said, Daniel Krawitz's hyper Bitcoinization. Right. which he coined himself and we're going to literally coin it. We're going to put it on a coin and we're going to deliver that coin with the definition on it to uh, BSV verified. If no one bids higher than him by the end of the month or whoever ends up with the highest bid right. and he'll own the property. But there's another tab here called celebrity nominations. And this is everybody that we think should probably define a word. <laughs> you can, That's fabulous. You can vote on it. So for instance, of value and entertainment as valuetainment. So someone put him up there for that. Uh, Emily Rad Radikowski is some kind of supermodel that's not my era. She should so define power. bikini. That's funny. She should define bikini. <laughs> uh, we have all these people in there, including famous people. There's Justin Bieber. You can put anybody you want and nominate them for a penny to... Be the def be the def the definition writer. That's really priceless. So as I was saying before, the lightning struck here in uh, New Jersey and took and not uh, metaphorically, actually, <laughs> actually, yeah. Um, we we were were basically I was leading uh, Christopher here to post his word, which I think is I I don't have, I think I have it cor perfectly correct. Something about corrected, miscorrected. Yeah, I haven't, got, I haven't put it in yet, but that's exactly it. It's it's a uh, uh, miscorrection, or as as the noun. But people miscorrect me all the time. They come at me and, and you know online and say, "Well, you're wrong because of X, Y, and Z." And the absolute beauty, beautiful joy of it is, they're wrong. So I call that miscorrecting. <laughs> it's a fantastic term. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, since you're a celebrity in your own uh, in your own right in your own ecosystem. <laughs> I'm going to nominate Christopher Messina for miscorrect. And when we have a month that's open, then what will happen is your word, you, well, you'd have to agree to it first, but I can still nominate you without you agreeing to it. But right. I'm going to literally put my two cents in and say, Christopher Messina should be the one to define miscorrect because I believe he invented the term, or if he didn't, he's pretty close and maybe he'll figure it out when he does the etymology. But um, who better than you that uses it all the time to 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 smith it? Right. So what will happen is it'll go up for auction, and if you know your followers or your uh, your people in your ecosystem think it's cool that you defined it, then they can bid for, to own your definition. So you're <laughs> kind of selling it to them. Nice. And then with with the proceeds from the auction, let's say it's like a hundred bucks because that's what we've gotten for the last two. Uh, then we'll put up word bounties with on your behalf or on anybody else's behalf. So, you know, you could put it up for, you know, the Brownstone Institute. Uh, if they had a, you know, hand cash or hair pay mail, they could get it too. Or, or you could just do it for yourself. And um, that's sort of the reward for donating your word as a, as a celebrity wordsmith. Nice. I love that idea. So as the mechanics of it, do I put my definition up now? And then people, no, no just wait. Exactly. Yeah, so it's it's kind of like a mystery box. They bid, assuming that you'll do some kind of good job or whatever. Right. And uh, at the end of the month, 
when the auction's over, then we we take your nominate your nomination amount, which usually is over two bucks uh, by that point, right. and we put you we put your word up for a bounty. In which case, you yourself will enter the bounty with your official definition of miss uh, miss correct, and then anybody else can challenge you, of course, um, and then that'll end after ten days. And it, when the ten days is up. You know, you, you'll either be paid as the winner. I don't know if we'll let you win, but somebody will be paid as the winner. Somebody will be paid as the winner, right? Exactly. And then your definition, along with any others that were written for that bounty, will be minted into these NFT-like objects. We call them SYNCs, which is uh, stands for Signatured Information Coins, because it's more accurate. Uh, it's not a token representative of a definition. It is the definition. And we right. take those uh, sinks and send them to your, your your Bitcoin wallet, and they sit there in addition to your coins. It's kind of like the credit cards. Give me, give to your, me with, your money with the term for sink again. You get a little distorted there just when you're saying it. It's a it's a what? A sink is a uh, signatured information coin. Signatured information coin. I like that. Okay, got yeah. it. So like. My dad uh, was sitting in Bookbinders, which at one time was the best restaurant in Philadelphia. And in walked uh, uh, Roger Maris, right. the, the baseball player who used to have the home run record. He's the guy that beat uh, Babe Ruth's home run record with 61 home runs in a season. Yep. And everybody in New York hated him for this because they, they wanted the Babe Ruth the record to stand ah. forever. And uh, anyway, my dad was a huge baseball fan, and he sheepishly walked up and got an autograph on a dollar bill. And uh, or maybe it was a napkin, but let's say it's a dollar bill because that's more accurate. Signs the dollar bill, uh, not Mickey Mantle, Roger Maris, and that dollar bill is no longer worth a dollar, right? It could be worth ten thousand dollars or whatever they pay for autographs these days. Well, that's what this is like. You're signing a coin and you're putting the definition on the coin, and there it sits on the blockchain, protected by your. Uh, cryptographic uh, signature or whoever owns its cryptographic signature and nothing will ever happen to it unless the owner wants to get rid of it right which is their right right like yeah, they can sell it's yeah. their property sure they can sell it they can move it they can do anything they want but the the key is that there's this own your own data concept that is lacking in Facebook and Instagram and everything else is Zuckerberg controls because mm -hmm. if you put your face up on Facebook as in a picture, he owns, he can make a billboard out of that and you can say nothing about it. In fact, that's already happened. Somebody uh, right. came up with a cool quote and they made the mistake of putting it on Instagram or Facebook and Zuckerberg put it up as a billboard in Times Square and that person can say nothing about it. They, get, they don't get a dollar. Yeah. But on in this case, when someone says, miscorrect, I use that all the time. I wonder who, I wonder who coined that term. Well, it's you who mm -hmm. coined it figuratively and but also <laughs> we're going to coin it literally so coin I'm, your turn I'm, I'm excited as all as all get out about that i'm the, you've given me a new addiction slictionary is, is the shizzle everyone has to get involved it's fabulous yeah right <laughs> i tell you what you know we we should do like a um when you finish your podcast if there's a word uh during the podcast that keeps coming up sort of like miscorrect with your guests, uh, you know, we'll we'll put it up as a as a bounty for your podcast, and you can at the end just say, "Hey, uh, we use the hell out of this word. Mm, go go define it. See if you can win the money." It's great. What I love about that too is, you know, people can do people can pursue that in their own way. For example, any bounties I win on this are going as a as a uh, donation to the Combat Control Foundation, right? So oh, perfect. Anyone can tag. Right where they wanted to go, right? If you happen to win this thing, it's great. It's hilarious. I won, I won, I won the bounty. I got my 12 bucks. You can go buy a couple of slushies. You can send it to your kids. You can give it to a foundation. You do whatever you want with it. Uh, I think, I think that's pretty awesome. And so let's say, <laughs> let's say your bounty for miscrack gets 30 bucks. Uh, maybe it's even just a friend of yours or someone who's uh, in this association buys it. That 30 bucks will go into like at least three bounties for 10 bucks. And you could do a uh, foundation, you could do, what, what was it called again? It was the Combat Control Foundation. They're the Special Operations Arm of the Air Force, so I'm on the board of that. And oh. we always direct, you know, whenever whenever something comes up, you know, if there's going to be so something that is what I would call kind of superfluous, unexpected 
revenue streams, you, you, you just send it to your foundation. That's like, like the one. I love the idea and the notoriety of getting of winning this correct. That's phenomenal. Uh, that's all I really need out of it, right? So when we if we do a bunch right. of things like this, we we pass it on to the foundation. So you just tell them to get a, any pay mail and ev- not only will they uh, get the, to own the words, com- they can put up, you can put up combat, you can put up foundation, you can put up the, the symbol, uh, you know, CAC or whatever it is. And every time someone looks that up and hits the little light bulb, they get paid forever, uh, right? So if they own uh, the best definition for combat, uh, they're going to, you know, we think that- That's if interesting. We get to get so combat, I can imagine there'll be some- Fist fighting over that because if someone decided to put up Navy SEALs, right? Well, that's aside from being odd in the military, but it's it's that's clearly a registered trademark of the US government, right? So, you know, um that is a question that that, that we didn't raise because in dictionaries predominantly, um it's always words, it's never proper nouns, right? So right. how do you deal with that in your context, right? Because I, well, I would love greater exposure for the Combat Control Foundation, as I repeat it constantly. Um, you couldn't put that up as a word in Slictionary because hey, it's it's just it's the name of a an entity, yep. right? So have you ever? Have, it's early days yet, but have you encountered anything like that where someone is in essence trying to patent the wheel? I think it's it's like any other platform. Uh, I, I think it's rule two thirty or three twenty. One of those, one of those numbers. Two thirty, Yeah. Two thirty, Yeah. And we're under the same, uh, we're under the same contract as that. So if, if we get a takedown notice, like someone uses their, uh, coat of arms, right. Without their permission, you know, all they do is they would hit it. We're, we're going to have a flag. We don't have that yet because we're so small, but right. uh, we're going to have a flag and uh, the flag will just say, oh, there's someone claiming this uh, copyright or whatever. And uh, the, or, or it could even be the owner of the word itself. Right. The owner of the word could be like, well, you plagiarized my work. Um, take it down. And so we're we're no different than YouTube or any other platform. Obviously, we'll comply with all that stuff. Uh, on the other hand, you know, uh, since we're a money making operation and we give seventy percent, and it probably will be higher than that at some point of the money that the that the, that the term earns, um, they might rather just claim it or right. just, or support it. You know, it, they they could make a private deal, right? It's just like anything else. If if someone coiffed your your joke. Uh, and put it up on a joke site and uh, you, you're making tons of money every year. Well, you may just want to leave it alone and say, hey, well, I don't know, like I helped you out to, to commercialize it. Maybe we'll do 80-20, maybe we'll do 90-10 and right. we could just rewrite the contract uh, to reflect that. And not only that, but unlike a Hollywood contract where your agent's taking a little bit and taking people on flights and private jets and you have no idea where the money's going, this is just automatic, right? You can see it on right. the blockchain. You know, there's my 80%, just like clock. God bless the free market. Uh, well, aside from my encouraging everyone to go to Slictionary, sign up, be part of it, get involved, define things, you know, um, what, what what's kind of the last message you'd like to leave people with about both kind of the intersection of where this technology came from and, um, you know, what your vision for the future is? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that the coolest thing about this is just that how it totally matches it's the closest thing you can design in dictionary and digital dictionary using all the tools that we have available today to to most closely reflect what's actually happening in the english language Hmm. and in other words the a really good dictionary guy there's a guy at um uh, Miriam Webster's who gets interviewed all the time and he's very right in the that he says we we don't invent the words we don't define them we record the definitions like the world comes up with fascism manism right. Webster's never could right I mean Craig Wright or whoever you want to think is Satoshi Nagamo came up with Bitcoin it wasn't urban dictionary it wasn't uh, Wiktionary. It wasn't uh, Oxford English. Someone working He's in the, the field who sees a neologism that most accurately describes some portion of their world, and they put that that neologism out there, and then either it takes off or it does not. And it's survival of the fittest in evolutionary terms for, for, right. for linguistic purposes. That's fun. It's a lot. And the of other fun. thing, 
I'll tell you a quick story that would be interested to your viewers uh, that I think truly reflects why our dictionary is going to be the best. Uh, we put up a $3 bounty for the word woman like two years ago, and that was a big deal, right? And maybe that had to do with the swimmer at uh, Penn University. Uh, you know, that everybody was wondering, is it what, what's going to happen in the Olympics? Is he going to swim on the right. girls team like what what's the world gonna say so apparently you know? now he's a, he's an antifa terrorist but anyway so aside from, <laughs> right. aside from that that specific uh, uh joyful bizarre biopic so you came up with this idea for a bounty on woman yeah so it was only a three dollar bounty so and it was this is in our first year so we didn't have a lot of people but we we had some randos that one was a very nice uh, lady from california and she put up a beautiful picture of a woman and defined it kind of in the classic way you might define it when I was a kid or whatever. And or then reality uh, intrudes. Yeah. <laughs> yep. And then we had this very nice guy uh, lived in Philadelphia and he's, you know, very young dude, a uh, he, he member of the uh, gay and lesbian association down there. And he entered the contest as well. Uh, I think he put a picture of the, vice president up as, as the woman so uh you know that's gonna incite a lot of uh you know uh, fervor on, sure. when you go look it up now the nice thing was uh i don't remember who voted on that but obviously it's like you know american idol they they could uh, rustle up the people to vote on the, the the bounty if they wanted we don't have a ton of um there's not a ton of depth to the uh award system yet there will be but for now for back then it was pretty pretty rudimentary anyway the guy in philadelphia won right That's so fabulous his definition shows up for woman now that was like two years ago or a year and a half ago and over time just from telling people that we have kind of all the definitions of woman not just one sides or the other uh people have looked it up and guess what they started voting and the cool thing is that the California woman's traditional definition of woman eventually overtook the other one and is now number one. Now, why do I find that cool? Because I suspect that on, on a social media site like Twitter, there are some people that are very loud and, and they would make it seem like maybe they represented 50% of what the world believes and the other 50% is the other side and maybe they're quiet. Yeah. But I think it turns out that we will find out the true um most believed definition of woman as a number like 99 to 1 it could be or it could be 70 30 it could be 50 50. it the could reverse real, real over time. time linguistic democracy that's phenomenal yeah and not only that but uh you know my dad used to say and i always tie this word in because it's kind of related but my dad always used to say i don't understand what's going on with this word gay like when I was growing up, Frank Sinatra was putting it in all his songs and it just kind of meant like frivolously happy. Like what, right. what's going on now? It's the seventies. Well, you know, I don't understand. So the word changed. Yeah. I, there's actually four definitions for the word gay. And if you go back to like the 1300s, you know, it's all, all 50 to 80 years, it changes. And the funny thing is, if Slictionary had existed that whole time, we could graph it. We could right. graph, graph the, the changes the and influence. That's really cool. I, yeah. In terms of, I imagine that over time, and there's, there's already people who do this. I remember a good friend of mine at the, at university was a uh, etymologist and just loved, you know, went on and on about words absolutely hilarious she, i think she later became the editor of the oed actually um but uh i love that because all the data mining that goes into it for linguistics and uh, uh, it's just going to be huge and there's just so much that can be done with it right and it's kind of like you know in terms of uh, in a positive sense a marketer's dream uh in a negative sense it's also I had a, a, a friend of mine, Brett Stevens, on, on the show, and he's a, a Pulitzer Prize winning editorial writer. And he laughed and he said, I find it really insane that the traditional industry publishing, which used to push the bounds of the First Amendment, he used to really now he's like, I'm talking to a mining executive who can speak his mind because he's not cancelable, whereas publishing houses have de rigueur sensitivity readings now before they publish something. 
right? He's right. like, the world is completely flipped on its head. How is that possible, right? But I can see, you know, a publishing house being like, oh, God, we got this book coming out and it's going to be a trigger. I don't know, get me some data. Go to Slictionary, buy their data. Tell me if this word is really going to piss people off or not. And I can see just huge amounts of kind of follow-up Right, derivative um, applications for what you're doing. They could market Longer beyond the just the dictionary. They could market the book with the controversial word. Put up a thousand dollar word bounty, which to them would be nothing, right? Yeah. Giant publishing house, and say, uh, "Here's this weird word. Let's see what people think about yeah. it by letting them define it themselves." No such thing as bad publicity, right? So, uh, I, I think I think you were onto something really cool, Jack. I hate to cut it short, but this is awesome. I love what you're doing. Uh, and I, I've got this horrible new obsession where I'm going to be, you know, co competing in word bounties and setting up, de setting up definitions, hopefully some of which will irritate people and get some discussion going. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, I, I've got the same uh, problem now. I, I, I went through your list of videos and I have seen uh, at least three of them because um, they're people that I know that you've interviewed. But uh, I was like, geez, I should be I should be subscribing, watching this all the time. It looks like good topics. All day long. I only I only have phenomenal guests on. So, Jack, thanks again uh, for, for your time. I will close, as I always do, to admonish my listeners to save themselves the brain pain, turn off the mainstream media who are lying to you, and tune into Messy Times. Ciao. Ciao. Learn what Bitcoin is, how it works, and why it matters. Bitcoin 101, your ultimate guide to the fundamentals of blockchain.